Before we begin, here's how to earn continuing professional education credit for attending this session. Gain valuable insights by attending the podcast, then complete the assessment test to download your certificate. To do this, follow these simple steps. Click on the link in your description to access the session. Create a free account and attend the podcast. After the podcast, take the assessment test and download your certificate. It's easy, and it's free. We highly recommend checking out our subscription. Uh, I find uh, communication very uh, effective in uh, working through resolving anxiety and depression if somebody can talk about that. Would you please, Dr. Pujan, shed some light on connection between communication, not just reporting, but really communicating all the feelings and the whole issue of mental health and mental illness. Well, com- communication is an expression of what's going on inside of you. And um, you're right that if someone, all that they think about communication is a complaint, then all that they're putting out in the world is that. I remember I was working with um, one of the therapists that worked for me. And um, in every meeting, every week that we had, she was having some complaint. And at one point I had a personal conversation with her and I said, I I just sense you're not happy here and I want you to be happy. And I'm more than, um, you know, it's okay with me if you no longer want to be here. I don't want you to think you have to suffer. And she says, why do you say that? I said, every single day you're telling me and everybody else around you about unhappiness. So I, I'm trying to, you know, work with you in uh, creating what you want, but I still get your unhappiness. So what is it that I can support you? But I also want you to know that if, if this is not your path, then this is not your path. And she said, no, no, no. I, I love And then she started talking about all the positive aspects of her work. And then she said, um, you know, I'm, we're, we're here. And I think when I'm upset, I just need to tell you. Well, there's a, there's a balance there that if in your mind, all you think about when you come to work is you're upset and all you're sharing is upset, that's in your world and that's all you're giving out. Hello everyone and welcome to our podcast series, HR Talk, Unpacking Trends and talent innovation. I am Ben mm-hmm. Bashate, your co-host with Dr. Eileen Isabelero. And today we are talking about empathetic HR promoting employee mental wellness. Today we have a privilege of having a great guest speaker, Dr. Fujian Zane. She is a psychotherapist, podcast host, international speaker, and author. She has a doctoral in clinical psychology, and she is a licensed marriage and family therapist practicing online and in her office in Southern California. Dr. Zane is the originator of awareness integration, educational and psychological theory and intervention, and also she's the author of six books in her fields. She is a lecturer at California State University, Long Beach, and is obtaining graduate certification in human behavior topics from Harvard University. She has been appeared in Dr. Field TV show, as well as major universities, including MIT, UCLA, UCSB, and Harvard. She has recently launched the Fujian app for everyone to have an opportunity to experience self-awareness and life fulfillment. With no further ado, we are welcoming Dr. Fujian as our guest speaker. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fujian, for joining us in this HR-related podcast. We certainly appreciate your time. We know how busy you are. As you know, I am here in the partnership with Dr. Zabalero from Rodwell and Associate, and we are doing podcasts on HR-related issues to how to empower HR departments to do a better job with workforce all around the world. 
And um, we call you because you are expert in psychology. And given this day and time, uh, the whole issue of work and life balance, you know, after the uh, uh, pandemic, uh, Corona-19 issue, a lot of people start working from home and going under a lot of stress. And uh, and you know better than anybody else that mental illness is a serious matter in home as well as work, as well as the society as well. So we prepared some questions to ask you about your, your experience and your input as an expert in the psychology and uh, obviously mental illness. So welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be with the two of you and a very, very important topic, actually, to talk about. Uh, and as you said, it, it uh, I think it was always there. But when COVID happened, it threw everybody off balance. And um, obviously, the ratio of depression and anxiety um, went higher for everybody. And then we're seeing that a lot of people are not, um, the, the culture is changing. And a lot of people are kind of refusing to go back to the same way that it used to be. Um, and they're trying to adjust. So I, I'd love for us to be able to kind of shed some light on this. Very, very well. You know, simple question. Why should the HR department or HR professional care about mental health? Because you, you, if, I know you're too young to remember, but I have read early, uh, late 19th century history of industries or early 20th century of industries that that was a time that nobody cared about health, forget about mental health. So there is a lot of federal agencies add a lot of uh, policies and procedures and mandates to keep the labor and workforce healthy. But I noticed in last two decades, mostly in the last decade, the whole issue of paying attention to mental health rise on the surface. The simple language, Dr. Pujan, why HR department or executives or company should care about this? Well, HR got created for a purpose. So the human resources, it's called human resources. So there's a part of uh, the actual purpose of the HR was to look at the human dynamic, right? So if there's an upset between uh, management and the worker or between workers or any of those, where do they go? They go to HR because HR's purpose is to take care of people uh, who are working from the human dynamic, right? So obviously, um, if if someone is upset at work or they're not productive because they're upset in any format, whether the upset is coming because of the dynamic of the workers or you know management and workers together, or if someone has an upset that is happening at home, um, whether there are illnesses or issues that are happening at home, and obviously they're not gonna shut it off when they walk in and clock in, that whatever that issue is comes with them to work and it's gonna affect their productivity, it's gonna affect their relatedness with anyone else who's around them. So it's a very important factor for HR to be cognizant of and look at it and and provide um, education, provide um, space so that people can feel comfortable and safe uh, to go to HR if there's any issues to be taken care of. So I see the purpose of HR actually um, from this perspective, very important to begin looking at mental health. Um, one of the other pieces has been you know, drug and alcohol abuse and abuse, which also comes from the mental health issues. If people have high levels of anxiety, anger issues, depression issues, sometimes they just go, you know, trying to numb themselves. And that affects their productivity and who they are during the work hour. So these are elements that are so important. And if they're not looked upon, we it, it, you're going to create issues. Um, the issues will be that when people are not satisfied, at work, they create conflict for themselves and other people. The lawsuits will be much more when it comes, you know, for the employees to have a lawsuit against the companies. And more than anything, they're not going to have a productive team, no matter how much they, you know, they want to um, give them information. These are not robots that go into work, gain information, produce and walk off. There is a human being with their feelings and thought process and belief systems and the relatedness of all the, you know, their wives, their husbands, their children, their parents, 
um, everything else that happens around them. And they've come in for between eight to 10 hours per day of being together at work. Yeah, great, Dr. Fujian. You kind of uh, answered my second question already. Relate that that was my question about what is the obvious connection between mental health and lack of productivity, which was you beautifully explain it. And uh, if you notice, and I'm sure you noticed, the, uh, the rise of emotional intelligence education through coaching and consulting these days, including myself, paying a lot of attention to introducing and training people in emotional intelligence and related elements of coaching that empower their more knowledge of emotional intelligence to understand why am I feeling this? Is it my feeling or is it my emotion? And there is a very close proximity between the description of the two that maybe only professionals can explain, right? People feel something and they call it their emotions. And you see, especially in this day and time, you see a lot of, as you mentioned, upset on the workplace because it seems like people are at edge, especially in the last 10 years. I don't want to call it the political environment, but economic environment, including the pressure of the political environment, made people to be so much at edge that they blow gasket immediately. Unfortunately, we saw so many horrible, horrible incidents that people take the firearm at work and start shooting the co-workers. I mean, that is, I think, I don't know what to call that. That is the ultimate not managing emotion and listening to your inner child about these things. Do you want to earn CPE credit? Take this course of My CPE to earn free credit. Click the link in the description to get started. Now, Dr. Fujian, what are your coaching to HR department or managers to pinpoint common mental illness issues or mental health concerns? What are the most common signs a manager or supervisor can, can or should pay attention to, to notice somebody's mental health issues. Well, one of the biggest mental health issues that happens and shows up at work is anxiety, right? There's a stress that shows up. And then based on that stress, if we can't handle the stress, um, almost any normal human being is going to have anxiety. Now, if people have learned what to do with their anxiety, obviously they'll learn to regulate it handle it and release it with different methodologies. But if they don't, and whether this anxiety is getting created because of their home life or it's getting created because of the dynamic at work, you can sense anxiety and anxiety at times when it's not handled, it shows up as frustration. It shows up as anger. It shows up as angry outbursts because anxiety, it, it feels powerless. So our system goes into the feeling and the emotion that it actually has power, which is anger. So a lot of us take anxiety and shift it into an anger. And if you, you know, if, if when somebody comes in and shows their anger, normally other human being also, you know, they want to defend themselves and go into anger. So the ability to recognize and have the ability to listen and to hear what is the issue that is getting the person angry, which underneath it could be fear, it could be anxiety, it could be certain expectations, that whether they're realistic or not, they need to be spoken about. There's a lot of different expectations, whether there's an employee or a management, and maybe if they're not communicated appropriately in a safe manner, um, that the anxiety gets built and it shows up in different level. And then the morale comes down because when someone is upset, even if they don't go into their, um, even if they don't go into their boss and talks about it, they're going to have the morality issue around. They're going to talk to other people around them. So you can see that the whole department morale is going to come back because they're all gossiping because something is not going well. So if, if uh, um, as a management, you really sense that, agitation happening consistently around as as a role model um it's it's your job it's it's our job as a management to create a safe place for for the person for people to be able to voice whatever it is that's going on um Dr. Bashan, one of the things that is happening which is a cultural shift from an authoritarian uh, type of you know management I say what you do you are subordinate remember the word subordinate yes. and I say you listen I tell you what to do and you know there is no ifs and buts about it that's your job go do it and there's a cultural change really into this space of like an equal space versus a top-down space 
And um, although everybody knows what their job is and who their supervisor is and who holds the power, but the communication is much more uh, coming to a culture of conversation and everybody has the right. Now, although there's a beauty in this, there's also a lot of boundary crossing. So it, the ability to know what are the boundaries, what are the conversations we can't have. There's a difference between a friendship and colleagueship and, you know, the, 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 the different stages that you have to report to. And many times people get into com confusion because they want to be friendly. They're friends. They want to open this. And then there's they can't gather it around and kind of like when they need to um, set forth uh, yes. firmly. They can't do that. So part of these are really a lot of training to go from one culture to another, um, to be able to find these ba appropriate boundaries between all of these levels. Absolutely. It's uh, one of my recommendations to my clients that don't work with family because of the same exact issue. Don't work with your wife or your husband, your family. Dr. Zavadero, what do you think about the whole thing so far? Well, it's funny to state about not working with your family when you're actually working at home. And so those boundaries of work and life really starts to blur, right? Um, yeah, I do have a question. You were mentioning earlier about how um, our anxiety can manifest itself in regards to anger or different ways that we're communicating how we communicate with others. You had introduced a new model in the field of psychotherapy, um, which incorporates the concept of cognitive, behavioral, emotional, and mind-body theories. Can you explain your concept of awareness integration and how that can be applied to addressing things like depression and anxiety in the workplace? Yes, absolutely. Um, with the awareness integration, we bring in the awareness on the, the name awareness, which is uh, the person becomes aware of their thought process, belief process, emotions and feelings and uh, behaviors, and then the impact of how when I have a particular attitude, right, if I my attitude is a positive way of looking positive way of assuming, and being positive with myself, obviously, my behaviors are gearing toward that and my emotions are and, you know, fostering that and therefore, um, you know, very, very high percentage that the, uh, inf the effect, the impact, the relatedness that happens is going to create more satisfying and more workable relationships versus for me to be caught into limiting beliefs, negative things. And, and even if I have those beliefs and negative emotions about myself and constantly create you know, anxiety about myself um, as I go into a place. If I think I'm not capable and if I assume other people are not thinking I'm capable, the way that I go in, the way that I behave is going to, uh, you know, the higher percentage of creating some limited or negative impact versus me being confident about myself and having an assumption that I'm valuable to other people. And the way that I would present myself, not defensive, it will be a growth between the relatedness that we have. And we all live in relationships, like even work is all relatedness. It's, right. uh, yes, we all relate over a product or a service, but we're all really doing this co in hey. collaboration with each other. So I think that's where you could see that if a, if a person have, have, has become responsible and accountable in how they are and how they deliver, what is their intention? What is their goal? And kind of aligning their thought and feelings and, and behavior toward that goal, there is a maximization of effectiveness and landing what you're really wanting to do. So it really supports the person to be on top of things and have agency, have high self-esteem and self-confidence, which when you have anxiety and depression, that's what it goes low, right? Anxiety, most of the time, appears to be something that I'm I'm viewing the future in a negative way. I believe in the negative terror, you know, horror movie that I've created, and I step into it and live as if that's going to happen. And therefore, I live with the fear consistently and move forward. Um, and then when I'm moving forward with fear and defensiveness, it impacts everybody else in my in in, in my surrounding because I'm putting. Imagine I I walk around and I you know put in a red. Um, a red dye everywhere I go. So I'm putting this in your world and you're going to react to me from that versus if I have a, um, a vision of the future, which is a collaboration of a positiveness, the color that I'm bringing with me as the energy is very different. So you're going to de deal with me from a different way. 
And depression happens most of the time where I look at something in the past. I remember all the negativity. I create helplessness and hopelessness for myself. And then I kind of throw this vision of the past that I experienced again onto the future. So not only I was helpless and not capable in the past, guess what? I'm going to be helpless and hopeless in the future. And I live in that, you know, low place. So what we do in awareness integration um, theory is to really educate the person to have a camera on themselves and how they deal with the world and really look at what I have control. I don't have control over the world, but I do have control over some of my thoughts and my emotions and my definitely my behavior. And based on that, I can gear toward uh, my goals and how I want to relate and my surrounding and my productivity um, in every single relationship that I have. Um, and one of the most re important relationships that affects everything is my work relationship. You had mentioned depression and anxiety, and that's on a rise right now. I mean, if you read a lot of the studies and research, the, even with um, the blind spot that came out several years ago, that's the worldwide study they've done in regards to mental wellness overall. We're in a high rise in regards to depression and anxiety. And especially now with us working remotely. So in terms of these ideas of you know, paying attention to these symptoms and the way we're manifesting and expressing these, what can HR professionals look for? I mean, what are some of the signs and how can they support each other, especially those who are remote? How, what do we look for in terms of being able to identify if somebody's in that space of depression and anxiety? Depression has this essence of the person not showing up at work at times. When they are, they're um, a very, very low energy. The wordings are pessimistic and very negative. They're consistently looking at the world isn't going to give them what they want. And they're upset. They're agitated about it. Depression shows up in two ways. One, it goes in and you go low and low energy and kind of want to sleep a lot or, you know, eat a lot. Some people don't eat at all. And it affects their sleeping pattern and then eating pattern. And then um, the kind of the low energy and negativity. So you can see this dark cloud around someone. They're, they're not going to give, the, they're not going to meet their deadline. They're going to try to avoid being with other people. And when they are, they won't look at you in your eyes. Their, you know, um, body features are kind of low and going down. And therefore, you could kind of, if you're even on Zoom and watching them, you know, on conferences where you're having, you can start looking at their avoidance and um, their delayed in cognitive processing. Part of the delay is because this, the background here is um, already processing something else. So it delays your um, attentiveness toward whatever is happening in front of you. And therefore, you can look at that um, and you can see if they have, uh, you know, if there's any way that they're not coherent because they haven't been sleeping a lot or sleeping too much or that they've maybe starting to utilize, you know, alcohol or drug in order to calm themselves down, which then shows up in slurry speech or um, not being very, very attentive. Uh, their eyes dilating. So you could watch that from their physical aspect, their voice low tone. And then those are the times that maybe you could just say, you know, I'm concerned. Is everything OK? I'm here for you. Let me know if there's anything that I can do. Anxiety shows up another way, shows up in more agitation. Their body is moving. They can't sit still. Uh, they're jumping in your speech. They don't want to hear the rest. I know it. I know it. But then you still hear this negativity that shows up. And it's what if, what if, what if, what if, what if about um, a negativity in the future and kind of dismissing any part of the positivity that shows up. They walk around a lot. They can't sit. Like you might be agitated as they're sitting in a, um, you know, in uh, the Zoom meetings. They might keep, you know, going off, coming back, going off, coming back, uh, moving their body consistently and not listening. And because you're not paying attention, you're not going to retain a lot of information. So they forget. They forget they missed their deadlines. They forget information that was given to them and, you know, they can't really recite it again. So and then they have like little mini outbursts uh, because the anxiety gets them and they can't tolerate it again. It's not like a water, um, a glass of water, which is already filled. And then one little drop, it just pours out. They just can't handle and tolerate it anymore. So those are the times kind of like to uh, to look at and um, kind of see the symptomology where you can see that person is not themselves. There, there's a difference, between, you know, that's going on with them. And then you simply ask, you know, is everything going? And when you say these things, it's important for, for you to have some concrete matters. Like when I was in a meeting with you, this is what I saw as the behavior. 
and all is well. I just wanted to check in. Is everything okay? And so they also realize that their behavior is showing up and somebody cares for them. And then from there, obviously, HR or, or anybody around, they could give them resources, whether the resources are in you know, psychotherapy and all of that. Another thing that I think that, you know, companies, if they have the ability to do, depending on the size, is also start promoting, um, you know, Morgan med meditations, yoga, uh, promoting that, you know, once there was, uh, I went to India once and they had this app, which is called Bizum, and you can get it anywhere. And on the hour, every hour, uh, it's called traffic light. And on the phone, it starts putting this one uh, 60 seconds music well, you could choose your music and 60 seconds and everybody stops and they just kind of start breathing deep and going. So it's like, you know, you can even create that as a culture in a company, like on, on the hour, every hour, there's something that comes and the whole world stops and just breathes. 60 seconds, two minutes, one minute, just breathe, come back, you know, create another intention, be here in your body and move forward again. So some of these little things that you could bring in the company where it balances your parasympathetic and you know sympathetic responses. And if you're constantly going, going, going for eight hours, you're going to snap. So at one point is like, can we stop uh, every hour or every two hours, depending on what it is, just very much like five minutes of deep breathing and deep breathing and calming your body and then coming back into the space of stress again. Access latest and trending CPE courses with my CPE's Unlimited Access subscription. Subscribe now. Thank you. Um, thank you for differentiating also depression and anxiety and especially those behaviors. It really helped me to take a look at my own um, experiences that I'm having, whether I'm depressed or anxious. Um, you mentioned that technique of just taking a deep breath or there's a lot of these mindfulness techniques. Are there any other exercises or techniques that you can recommend for people who are working remotely? Like right now, I'm having some anxiety because I'm taking care of my mom, but I'm still trying to do this. What, what would you recommend to help mitigate some of those um, emotions before they actually, before it's the final drop in that glass of water and it overflows? Well, anxiety, when you talk about anxiety, there's a movement in the body and you can see the body by itself naturally starts to move. Mm -hmm. So when you have anxiety, don't sit down, walk, you know, even if you have your uh, laptop or whatever it is, put it in a way where you could walk around. You know, if you can put it in your phone, you put, you know, you're in a meeting or conversation. Some people have, um, uh, they stand, take a stand and kind of, you know, do like a treadmill while they're walking. So walking helps a lot because what it does is releases a lot of the built up energy that is happening from the anxiety in your physical body. So movement helps a lot with like, releasing the anxiety. In the mornings, uh, exercise. Most people who have high level of anxiety we, the prescription is twice a week, twice a day of exercising, maybe different exercise, but definitely in the morning to have some cardio in order to change the chemistry of your body and get you ready to move forward. Creating intentionality. What is it that I want to create? What, you know, the sentence is what I intend to create, not what the world is going to bring in front of me. What I intend to create with whatever it is. Sometimes it's like, I intend to be patient with the world, whatever comes. I intend to be accepting of whatever is coming because I don't know. I'm going to guess that it's going to, some stuff is going to come or I'm going to create. But the world has its way of just being the way it is and it's going to pop up with different things. So um, sometimes anxiety comes because I have my to-do list and I've got all of this and you know nothing should come in between and anything that comes in between these hours you know, it's a disruption to me. But if my intention is that I'm going to do my best to go through this and whatever shows up, I'm going to handle. So it's more of creating a sense of openness for yourself and bringing that. Sometimes it's put a visual cues, you know, put, putting visual cues around um, of that. I remember um, when I had my clients sit on a couch behind the wall of what they sat, I bought, the, I put this huge collage of love, freedom, you know, um, um, acceptance and, you know, these beautiful sceneries that just by visualization on a, you know, around their head, it was giving me back the message for me to consistently stay, regardless of what trauma they were talking about. That visual sense reminded me of consistently staying in my love and acceptance and compassion. 
So you can put visual boards uh, all over yourself so that it reminds you. You can put music around. They're binaural beat music. You can get them from you know YouTube free. You can put it as a background for yourself so that it consistently tells your body that the world is safe. It's okay. You don't have to be all like, you know, frazzled about it. So these are all the little things that you could create around your environment. And then after work, do yoga, do stretching, get every stress that was in your system out, especially if you have children going home from work or you're going from one room to the other where your kids are. Take five minutes, 10 minutes of shifting from a work environment and work thought to a family space, right? If you need to go do yoga or walk or do something, great. If not, you just sit on a couch, put a little bit of music and just imagine completing with whatever it was at work, even writing. This is the, what I've done. This is what I'm going to do tomorrow. And for the next two to three hours, I'm off work and I'm here present with my family. So you could compartmentalize, you know, I'm shutting down, I'm stay, staying here and setting boundaries for yourself and not constantly having emails from work and coming all hours. Those are certain hours that I allocate to work. And these are certain hours that I allocate to me and my body. There's a certain hours that I allocate to my family. Those are some great suggestions, especially the ideas of boundaries. <laughs> I think that's harder and harder for us to be able to establish those. Um, I'm going to pass it back over to Dr. Benham. Dr. Benham. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoy listening to all these elements coming at me. And what's, as you were talking, I was thinking about the depth of communication that is not being used in organization level as much as it could be really powerfully make a difference, you know? The, usually when an employee is in upset and somebody asks him, have you communicate your upset? In their mind, they think, have I complained yet? That is not the point of communication. Whereas really letting your manager or your supervisor knows what you feel and why you feel that, which is going to bring us back to whole understanding and education on emotional intelligence. Uh, I find uh, communication very uh, effective in uh, working through resolving anxiety and depression if somebody can talk about that. Would you please, Dr. Pujan, shed some light on connection between communication, not just reporting, but really communicating all the feelings and the whole issue of mental health or mental illness? Well, can communication is an expression of what's going on inside of you and um, you're right that if someone all that they think about communication is a complaint then all that they're putting out in the world is that i remember i was working with um, one of the therapists that worked for me and um, in every meeting every week that we had she was having some complaint and at one point i had a personal conversation with her and i said I, I just sense you're not happy here and I want you to be happy. And I'm more than, um, you know, it's okay with me if you no longer want to be here. I don't want you to think you have to suffer. And she says, why do you say that? I said, every single day you're telling me and everybody else around you about unhappiness. So I, I'm trying to, you know, work with you in uh, creating what you want, but I still get your unhappiness. So what is it that I can support you? But I also want you to know that if, if this is not your path, then this is not your path. And she said, no, no, no. I, I love And then she started talking about all the positive aspects of her work. And then she said, um, you know, I'm, we're, we're here. And I think when I'm upset, I just need to tell you. Well, there's a, there's a balance there that if in your mind, all you think about when you come to work is you're upset and all you're sharing is upset. That's in your world and that's all you're giving out. So the first thing is, can I balance that inside? So I share with people, start journaling and then read your own journal and kind of do this, um, you know, like a, a red um, circle around all the negativity and then do like a blue circle. You could choose your own color um, around positivity and see what the balance is here. And if you are off balance, can you first just bring them to, you know, one to one ratio and then maybe even bring it into to two one ratio as positivity, because obviously all the research shows that if you are putting yourself in a positive um, mental state, you have that better energy, your whole system, all your organs, every part of you and your relatedness becomes positive. 
So the first concept is oh, who am I and what am I doing? Because whatever is happening here is being communicated out, whether it's through your body language or whether through your words are coming out. And that's what you're presenting to the world. Now, if you want a shift, obviously just complaining without stating what your desire, what your needs are and what some of the solutions are so that you can you know, be satisfied and happy or that you can give to the community, um, it needs to be there. But just because I complain and then I dump the responsibility on you to figure it out in how I'm supposed to be satisfied, I'm going to be very dissatisfied because the way you're going to think how I would be satisfied would probably not satisfy me. Right. I'm the only one who knows how to satisfy me. And it's my responsibility to know it, to figure it out and to share it, to request it, to negotiate for it. I think part of what we do we look at our bosses as our parents and as a, I'm five year old, my bosses are my mommy and daddy, and I'm just going to come in and say, give me, give me, give me. And then they give me chores and I got to do my chores and then they give me my reward. Well, it isn't, you know, that just, that's not the case. We're, we're grown ups. We're not, you know, in a family setting and a family dynamic and we create our own dynamic there. Although, yes, there is a structure in the culture of the company. It is like a family style of a culture that we come into. And yes, as a grown up, we got to figure out the culture. Do we want to choose to stay in this culture? Do I have the ability to shift the culture, to enroll others into other culture, but co come out of the passive, you know, helpless position and become active and honor myself. And when I honor myself, know that I'm valuable, then I bring the value into the communication. Yeah, you know, funny thing is, as you're talking about communication between the staff, employees, and a boss or supervisor, there is a couple of strategies that uh, I think absolutely fail in organizations. One is the open door policies. When I talk about open door policies, they literally laugh at my face. Really? What open door policies? If we go talk about our issues to our manager, or HR, they're going to use it against us. So they're suppressing, the, that fear caused suppression to not talk about the issues that are bothering them. Another strategy failed is a suggestion box. Uh, people dropping the suggestions to HR or managers to see, they read it, they throw it away because they take it personally or uh, they take it in, irrelevant. And that's a training uh, that HR can actually implement for their manager or their decision-making staff to really implement a open door policy with the sidebar of the confidentiality. Because if there is no confidentiality and safe space, open door policy would not work. Dr. Fushan, what strategies can HR professional use to create a workplace culture that supports mental wellness and reduce the mental illness stigma because that is large well, part of uh, i think education is the most important factor so there could be pamphlets there could be uh personal development classes there could be um you know um sometimes you, we have amazing um tv shows or we have movies that deal with it so kind of promoting sometimes you know allowing like two hours of saying you know, come watch a movie, put a, you know, screen up and uh, have a movie and then have discussions where it's like, you know, it, this is because sometimes it's e it's easier to talk about someone else and relate to it and share because you're talking about a topic versus me going to HR who's not a therapist or a counselor or other people. And like you said, might not trust with all of this thing to be able to to share and HRs, you know, ultimately the companies, um, the companies bottom line is to take care of their bottom line so they're not their job is not to be a therapist so again those are the boundaries but somehow if we bring the topic outside of ourselves and put it on the table and everybody begins sharing about a topic that topic sharing not sometimes they do personal sharing but it's removed a little bit where they feel comfortable you and I have done uh, courses before. I've done a lot of, you know, uh, self-development courses. And one of the funny thing was the same exercises that I proposed in uh, courses that just people showed up without knowing each other versus doing exactly the same course in a company, it wouldn't work. 
because in a company they weren't going to share because tomorrow they had to face the other person and they didn't know what was going to happen and it was going to change their dynamic. So we had to change completely those exercises that it wasn't personal and it was out there topic where they felt comfortable enough to give their ideas. Okay. And they receive things from it. So they er, learn things and they could take it in. And if they chose to journal on their own, like, you know, you give them a pamphlet and whatever they get, they learn it and they take it away from them. So they do this group thing, but then they make it personal and they take the personal away. And then they, you know, accessibility to if someone needs more of these things, they could go and take care of themselves, you know go to a psychotherapist or a counselor or a coach and be able to handle things personally. But I think in a bigger picture, education, psych education, emotional regulation education, techniques that they can use, it should be something that is not geared toward one person, but it's geared toward the whole culture of the company. So um, as I said, like, you know, putting music on and asking, creating a culture of everybody just quiet down for one minute. You know, when somebody passes away, what do we do? Like take one minute of silence and everybody listens. Right. So it's the same thing. We don't have to die before we do this. We can just say in order to be healthy, can we on the hour, every hour, just be quiet, slide, silence for one, go into your body, breathe and come back. So you can create these kind, kind of um, uh, concepts around Plus that, you know, the serenity of the um, offices, you could create a culture of serenity with your, um, um, with uh, like furniture, with the visual effects that you have. Um, and when you are, you know, have you watched like sometimes bosses walk around like that? Well, that just, you know, creates more fear for everybody. So another culture, which is like, if you're upset, if you, you know, how we with children, what do we say? Go to your room, take a time out, Take care of yourself. So if anybody's upset, it's okay. You could have a quiet room. You could have a pondering room. You can have somewhere where there's a calmness and you can sit there and kind of, you know, calm yourself down, right? Take a, take a break from the world. Sit there, take care of yourself, come out and then go. Because with this huffing and puffing going around the company, you're elevating everybody's stress, yes, right? They do. Another thing is that if you're in a company, you don't need to have, you know, CNN and Fox News consistently talking about wars in your company. That is not something as, you know, you're not putting entertainment, you're putting, um, you know, you're putting uh, stressful news consistently, you know, blasting on, on a company wall. That might not necessarily work because the company, everybody who's there is already stressed enough. And they need to pay attention to whatever it is that they're doing. They don't need to get distracted by, you know, um, other aspects of who shot who at what point in what country. Oh, so those, those are some of the visual, uh, kinesthetic, and uh, auditory um, influences that you can bring in to just bring, you know, every calm down the system. While, you know, you might also, if you have, if, if there's a, your job is in a way of a high working, you know, sales, then some hours of the day, you can pump up music that gets people going and, you know, like cardio music, which gets yes. everybody happy. And then there, there could be hours where you bring down the music and calm, and again, parasympathetic, you know, needs to calm down the sympathetic response. So you need to be active and go, go, go. But then every couple of hours, you need about 20 minutes of, and then go, go, go again. So visually and auditory, you could create these things around the company to help people kind of even regulate their emotion. Very, very interesting. Again, as you're talking and I kept thinking, and I was looking in my head that statistically, I can say with confidence, statistically, on the last 30 years, I work with organizations, small, medium-sized businesses, family businesses. Wherever we start working, on effective communication, mindfulness, active listening, emotional intelligence, suddenly productivity arose without changing any stuff, without changing plans, without changing goals and outcomes, productivity and performance rise. And they're scratching their head. I said, because you're kind of feeling yourself with all this upset and anger, right? And if you release them, suddenly you're lighter to do whatever you love, or as you said, you don't. You always have a choice. You're not a tree. You're not a stuck anywhere. You can go work somewhere else that satisfy you. However, as I always said to people who go from one job to another job to another job, I tell them, isn't that funny 
that bad manager keep following you from a state to a state and you keep working for the same manager, maybe, just maybe, has something to do with you. Just consider you might not resolve your upset and anger or expectation. Uh, yeah. about, let's talk about the future, focusing on the future of mental wellness. What do you think, Dr. Pujan, about cross-culture workplaces, which is very common these days? I can say compared with last two decades, there is an increase of uh, evidence, increase of presence of cross-cultural workplace and the whole issue of inclusivity. What do you think there is a, or if there is, from your point of view, connection between practicing empowering cross cultures and inclusivity with reducing mental issues or mental wellness? I think that the most important factor is knowing that um, anywhere we go in the world, we're going to be with people who are different and then yet uniquely similar. So how do we get together? We get together because of our similarities. How do we learn? We learn from our differences. So I think it's a, first of all, it's a mental state. It's an outlook. So that when no matter who I meet, even if I meet someone who is exactly like me, even if I, you know, go sit with my sister or brother from the same group, from the same family, I can still look at how are we similar and how are we different. We can connect our similarities and learn from each other, from our, you know, kind of create a compatibility of, of what your strengths are and I don't have and versus vice versa. I have a strength that you don't have and how we can bring that, especially in a team effort of, of work. So when we come from that place, um, there's a different way of relating to each other because we could love and accept each other because of our similarities, because we know and we feel safe for that similarity and not allow the differences to scare us from each other or feel threatened by the differences. But the differences are only like, oh, there's a different view. How cool. I won't, I won't get bored because there's so many different views around here that I would always get, you know, learn more and get entertained because of the differences. And the concept of if I can bank and invest on our differences, right, while I feel safe with our similarities, because investment in our differences comes to brings the collaboration together. I don't know everything. I will never know everything. I'm not going to be best at everything. But if I if you're great at something uh, and I can, you know, be with you collaborating, utilizing your strength and vice versa, that's how I think that the, the whole concept of togetherness will move forward. In this environment, we're all going to feel safer. And when you bring safety into an environment, it uh, lessens the pressure on the um, sympathetic responses of stress and moves up your parasympathetic responses, which creates relaxation for you, creates openness for you. And when you're open, you produce more. If you're closed and always scared, your productivity goes lower. So the concept of wherever we are, you know, in a global in a global way, um, every day we're dealing, you know, in, in our own household, every day we're dealing with phone calls to India, to China, to Hong Kong, to Australia, to different places. And every single culture is different with different businesses, different business tactics, different business ethics, different even, you know, kind of like authority, how you speak with an authority is different. So it. If you can bring yourself into a learning mode, then you're always learning versus like, I know it, I got it. You know, this is the way I'm just going to do. I'm just going to be this fixed person, which I'm going to go to anybody else in the world and just behave the same way. It's not going to cut it. So the understanding of an openness of it's OK about me and who I am, but I also need to be open and watch and read. You know, if I'm saying something which the person's facial expression and body language just changes and the dynamic between us just goes from, you know, nice and sweet to tension, I would want to stop at that moment and kind of imagine what, what just happened, that the tension got created and how can I create safety as soon as possible for whatever dynamic and communication we're having. I think if we come from this space, um, a lot would be changed in the way that we are together because this isn't changing. We're not going back to a solo, you know, race or gender or particular culture only working with each other. The world just doesn't go back to that anymore. 
Yes, yes. Thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes left, Dr. Bujan. What is your last comment or tips for HR department to deal with the wellness, health, wellness issues? HR professional has, tips. Well, HR has a different, uh, has a hard place like between a rock and hard place because their job is supposed to be taking care of the company and all aspects of it. And their job is to take care of all employees and aspect of it. So, you know, I know that it's a very difficult place to be. But I think that uh, looking at every employee as an asset to the company and not looking at them as a liability to the company, every single human being that comes in and is working is an asset to that company. So how do you deal with a jewel? How do you deal with, you know, like if you had if you had a diamond, um, you know, on your on your hand, how would you handle it versus you had cumic zirconia? You would handle it with a lot of different delicate care and and value. So if, if the HR not only looks at obviously the opportunity of the company, but the company will not be company unless every single person who's working for it is valued for who they are. If that value is expressed to them, then it's much more that they will be, um, you know, experiencing the openness and open communication. Another aspect of asking like the suggestion box or, you know, all of those stuff you were talking about, if it's put in a place of, yes, you can write it, you can write it and then just come and tell us. You don't have to give us the writing, but you can make an appointment. Write it down. Give them the homework first. Write it this down and then come back and talk to us. And maybe that from the awareness integration is, you know, what is what is it that you like to share? And you could, you know, you don't write like what's your criticism or what's the problem? What is it that you like to share with us? Can you share a positive thing that's happening for you in this work? Can you share a negative thing that is happening in this work? What are your thoughts about it? Positive, negative. What are your feelings that you experience? What how are you dealing with this on a positive level? You know, how do you deal with it in a negative level? If you had a solution for this matter. If you were in a position to give solutions and ideas, what would you suggest and how would you offer to implement the solution? You know, somebody says, go to the moon. Thank you. Now, could you please offer us some ways to get to the moon? How, if you were in a position to actually, you know, handle what you're suggesting, what are the ways to be able to do this? Now, the person who's writing this, they have to look at all angles. Now, it's not like, you know, here, do it. You know, mommy, give me. <laughs> if you don't give me, you're bad. It's like you handle all of those and then you sit down with them and go over and elaborate and elaborate and keep writing and writing and just say, you know, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And let me take this, you know, to the people who can do something about it and I'll come back to you. And whatever it is, maybe you can put that person, the HR doesn't even always have to be the one in between. They can now go to the person and bring these two together and say, you know, share with each other because from a management perspective, which has to have uh, handle budgeting, money, bigger picture you know, a 10 year um, kind of a vision, their perspective and vision might be different from someone who is day to day, they're just, you know, looking at something. And sometimes when we bring these things together, everybody gets a bigger picture. So it's not just, oh, can't do it, dump. Oh, the, they just don't understand, dump. Well, they do understand some things, but that vision, that complaint is going to be there as long as it's not handled. So it does need to be handled in an appropriate communication level. Very well, everybody. Dr. Pujan Zain, creator and designer of awareness integration model of psychology. He was so, we are so grateful to having you here. And I'm personally honored to know and work with you for the last almost 30 years. Call you a friend and colleague. Thank you very much. Anything for you, Dr. Zavallaro? Oh, I just want to say thank you so much. It was very, very insightful. Your your experience, your knowledge has really been expressed, and I really am grateful that you're here with us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much for the opportunity. It was great to be with the two of you again. Access latest and trending CPE courses with my CPE's Unlimited Access subscription. Subscribe now.